Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to the Global Black Economic Forum stage, where we have Louisiana Economic Development as a host sponsor. My name is Makisha Jetson. I'm very excited to be your moderator this morning. I am ready now to introduce my panel. We have first Assistant Secretary Brenda Guest for Louisiana Economic Development. Next, we have Mr. Craig Stephen, owner and CEO of Genesis 360 LLC. Next, we have the first African American owner of a national hamburger franchise system, Mr. Nicholas Perkins. And I don't know how the Lord blessed me to get this woman on this stage today. But we have the deputy assistant to the President Joe Biden, the senior advisor to the Kamala Harris, Vice President of the United States, Miss Stephanie L. Young. And very own to Louisiana, Louisiana homeborn, my boy from McKinley High School former state representative of District 101 for Louisiana, and now the current regional administrator for the United States Small Business Administration, Mr. Edward Ted James. All right, let's have a seat. Let's get this conversation started. First, Ms. Brenda, let's start with you. You've been at LED for 36 years. Yes. That's a long time. That's a Let, very long tell time. Tell us about LED and the things that they do for small businesses, minority and black owned businesses. Well, let me just tell you how great it is to be here and to thank Essence for having us. And Louisiana Economic Development is uh, responsible for business startups within uh, the state of Louisiana. A lot of times they think about large businesses being helped by incentives and programs, mm -hmm. but our small business community is what really is the backbone of our state. That's awesome. And we brought Mr. Craig Stevens here because he has been in almost every LED program and assistance that has been offered. Uh, certified SBA, certified veteran, uh, all the things. And you have an amazing story of how you uh, became an entrepreneur. Tell us, Mr. Stevens, about your story. Yeah, I'll give you the Reader's Digest version. So I'm originally from a small town called Opelousa, two hours west of here. I uh, wanted to go to college, but was needed money. I was trying to get out of poverty, so I joined the Air Force. Um, did, little did I know that I was still one paycheck from poverty while in the Air Force. And so I uh, started uh, working at a convenience store chain called Circle K, and then um, eventually left active duty military, started working at Circle K full time. So fast forward 22 years later, I'm director of operations for Circle K. I was still in the Air Force, so I just, uh, became an officer. And then 2011, I was trying to figure out what, what was I gonna do with my life? What was the next chapter of my life looking like? And I started a parking lot striping company. And um, now you fast forward again, another 12 years, um, we're doing a lot of federal work across the US, um, thanks to the SBA program, thanks to LED and uh, just performing on uh, multi-million dollar contracts. So we're, we're pretty blessed. That's awesome. And it's interesting you mentioned that SBA program. Nicholas Perkins, you also have a similar story uh, about how you started what is a now multi-million dollar Perkins management company, serial entrepreneur here through the SBA programs. Tell us about your story too. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, uh, I started Perkins Management Services uh, with the goal of providing contract food services management to the United States Department of Defense. And we participated in the 8A business development program for nine years. Uh, and uh, we partnered with uh, the uh, Department of the Army, Department of the Air Force, the Navy, the Defense Health Headquarters, managing food services contracts under the 8A program. And it was very um, instrumental in, in our development of our infrastructure that helped us then transition uh, into what we consider to be full and open competition and uh, competing for our nation's historically black colleges and universities. So the SBA was very instrumental uh, in the development uh, of my company and how we were able to develop infrastructure to be able to compete. Absolutely. And we're, we're mentoring the SBA. And I wanted Ted James to, to kind of explain to our audience what the SBA is and then we'll go back 
to Ms. Brenda and let us know about the video that they just saw about the SSBCI program, which is another federal program, and then we'll get to Stephanie. Ted? Hello. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Makisha. Thank you for having me. I'm um, so excited to hear um, that the programs that we tout at the SBA, especially under um, this administration to help businesses start, grow, and expand are uh, working. And we see two um, shining examples of those programs where we help um, connect small businesses to capital, um, not just traditional capital, but under our, this administration, um, we have expanded those to mission-based lenders, lenders that are intentional about investing in business owners of color. Uh, we are doing that. Uh, we've heard mention of the 8A Business Development Program. Mm -hmm. It is a program for any minority business looking to seek procurement opportunities with the federal government. Under our program, you do not have to bid for federal government contracts. So you get the opportunity for sole source awards, and there's a 5% goal across the federal government for awarding to 8A um, companies. Under the Biden-Harris administration, the president very early in this administration signed an executive order to almost triple um, that percentage. So we are on tap to uh, get to a 25% procurement goal in the 8A business development program by the end of this administration. And Ted, th people may not understand that, but when you get these contracts with the federal government, these are life-changing contracts. These are not just minimal contracts. These are wealth-building contracts for the African-American community. And not only that, this Biden-Harris administration has issued a $10 billion program through the state small business credit initiative. And Louisiana is able to get $113 million to help support uh, many of the small and disadvantaged companies in Louisiana. Ms. Brenda, can you tell us about that program? Oh, absolutely. We received the uh, uh, initial of 74 million, but we have the, the ability to get up to $113 million. And I'd like to say for those of you who are in the audience that may not be from Louisiana, every state in the country was eligible to receive these dollars. So when you go back home, check with your departments of economic development uh, because they've got the money to help with business startups. We also can help with the expansion of businesses, and that's a really great thing. And when you think about businesses to grow the, uh, our ecosystem within the state, that's what this, the money was all about. And the hats off to this administration, the Biden administration, for bringing these dollars to uh, Louisiana and the rest of the country. Many of the challenges that we have learned that many of our African-American and uh, black-owned, women-owned minority businesses is access to capital. So by this administration giving $10 billion with a B to the states across the United States. And so we know we have many visitors here who are not just from Louisiana. We love our Louisiana folks, but if you are in any other state, check with your Department of Economic Development, Department of Commerce, your Economic Development Authority, and see how you can get access to those funds to increase your capital. Now, Ms. Stephanie Young, we have been talking about this Biden-Harris administration and their love and support for the black community, the black business owners, women business owners, minority. I want to get your feedback. What has this administration done uh, for this community? Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. And I feel like my job has almost been done for me, which I'm really grateful for. Um, but uh, just this week, the president rolled out his Bidenomics agenda, which essentially uh, underscored uh, what our priorities are when it comes to uh, how are we making an economy that works for every single American, no matter who you are? A couple of things I just want to highlight. A part of Bidenomics that he announced was making smart investments in our infrastructure, manufacturing, and clean energy. In addition to that, empowering American workers with better wages, uh, also helping more workers actually join the workforce through training and development. And the third pillar of Bidenomics is promoting competition through lower costs to help small businesses. And one of the things that we're very, very proud of in this administration is that um, almost, um, uh, well, not almost, but small businesses have um, increased 
um, at a higher rate than they have in any other administration in the last two years, um, because this is a, extremely important for us. In addition to that, you, you heard all about the federal contracts uh, or the contracts um, that you could get, uh, but our goal is to increase federal contracts by 50 percent to ensure that more people have access to that. And I think another thing that we're very, very proud of is the fact that the Commerce Department has created uh, the Minority De uh, Business Development Agency. That's been something that's been around, but it is permanent. Um, and this is the only federal agency dedicated to small businesses and connecting minority-owned small businesses to exporters, public and private sector buyers, uh, and so much more. And you can get grants by going to mbda.gov uh, and learning more about how you can be connected to these opportunities. So we're not just talking about what we want to do, we're, we're showing it through our actions. And I know states like Louisiana and, and states all across this country um, are feeling the effects of that. Uh, and I know, Ted, I'm going to kick it to him <laughs> and not you to know, take over. No, not at all, because you mentioned the MBDA, and we was trying to get that special person at the MBDA, the Undersecretary, Mr. Don Cravens. Who Don Cravens, our, he right from person. New Orleans. Yes, from New Orleans, from Opelousas, and he has a legacy family here, a former state senator. And um, I'm so glad that you mentioned the MBDA and the work that they are doing. So many resources. They have the Capital Readiness Program. And Ted, I'm going to kick it back off to you because that's the route we were going. You know, I, I think that what's also important uh, for this administration, and, and Stephanie mentioned it, uh, we are not just talking the talk. We're actually walking the walk. And equity is not just a buzzword in this administration. Um, you see it all through our policy. I know Essence, we're celebrating women. I see that sign, Trust Black Women, there yes. under this administration. Uh, we have a women's business center in every state in the country. Nine of them are housed on the campuses of historically black colleges and universities. That's intentional. That's purposeful. That's not just a buzzword. We are also, I mentioned that contracting goal. There's a 5% a, a contracting goal for women-owned small businesses. The first year of this administration, we exceeded the goal. The second year, we exceeded the goal. This year, we're on tap to hopefully do that again because we are being, again, intentional about it. Um, I see so many members of our Divine Nine family here. The Ooh. vice president was so critical um, to make sure that we invested in our Divine Nine community and our agency has rolled out a historic MOU that many of you will be hearing about at your boules and conclaves and all of those different um, activities that we all have through the Divine Nine. Absolutely, and I'm so glad you mentioned that too. So, I'm, Nicholas, I'm gonna actually go back to you because I, I've studied your story, and there was a point that you uh, needed some assistance as you had the Perkins Management Company, and COVID hit, and you turned what was a down period for most businesses, and you scaled that thing, and you <laughs> came out with record-breaking announcements at the age of 40. Tell us about that, and also tell us about that process that you had to go through with the banks to get to where you are now. Well, it, it was a very arduous process. I mean, uh, I think we can't uh, overstate the uh, adverse impact that the pandemic had, you know, on our economy, but especially uh, even more so in the minority community, especially minority-owned businesses. And so it was almost a, a crossroads, right? You know, every food service contract we had at every college campus, every military installation was shut down. And so we went from, you know, you know, all of our revenues went to zero, right? And so, you know, I had to figure out, you know, how I was going to keep the thousand people that I had in working for my business employed, but then also had to find ways to diversify the company. And a lot of times in those midnight moments, depending upon your perspective, you know, you can find opportunity in those. And, um, you know, I had gotten involved uh, pre-pandemic uh, in the pursuit of Luby's Incorporated, which was the parent company to the hamburger chain Fuddruckers. And, you know, that process continued. And uh, when things began to pick back up, you know, we were in that competition. There were 149 other companies that were bidding to purchase the Fuddruckers hamburger chain. And everybody was scared of restaurants. So everywhere that I turned, you know, everybody was saying no. They didn't want to get back in the, in the restaurant business in terms of financing it. So I had to be very creative in terms of how I went about acquiring that business. And so, you know, I rolled the dice. I made another uh, personal investment, again, in my own business. And I went back to Luby's and I told them, I said, hey, I can give you this much money down and I need a seller note for a short period of time so I can get it refinanced when this economy turns around and they bit. 
and I won, so that's how I was able to become the first African-American franchisor. So there's always a way. Mm -hmm. You just have to persist. Yeah, and let me tell you, the folks in New Orleans want their foot records back in Harris. I'm going to just tell you <laughs> Absolutely. that right now. <laughs> and Craig, I want to talk to you as well. I want you to uh, close this out, and then I'm going to give an opportunity for everyone to give a closing statement about your business because you started out as parking lot, right? And now you have a multi million dollar company and what I love about it is both of these gentlemen have an aspiration and they will manifest it to become African American billion dollar companies let's give it up for that right. we gonna manifest that thing yeah so Craig go ahead and talk about your uh, entrepreneurship story yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you I received that um, so we have four divisions so we started out as a parking lot striping company and then evolved into construction ground maintenance building maintenance and IT services my degree is in IT so I launched that division last year, and it's going to be my biggest division out of all of them combined. Um, but knowing that my business is not even about me, my business is about being a blessing to other people, whether it's subcontractors, whether it's employees, where, whether just speaking to individuals who are looking to become an entrepreneur. And so just a couple takeaways that I would say, if, you know, if you're a business owner, don't despise small beginnings. As I mentioned, you know, my first contract was with the federal government. I made 68 bucks on it. I didn't lose any money, so I was excited. And eventually that multi-million dollar contract came, but I was very persistent. The other thing is, be the best you can be at whatever level you are. No matter what small level you begin at, always be the best you can be. And the last advice I think this applies to everybody in the room is that when you recognize that what you're calling is, what your assignment is by God, nobody can stop you. Once I recognized that my assignment is Genesis 360, nobody could stop me. And so my assignment is not my purpose. My assignment is separate from my purpose. So my assignment leads me to my purpose. And my, your assignment is, has dark, dark nights. So don't think because I'm having a bad day, bad moment, bad year, that it's not your assignment. It's preparing you for the next chapter of your life. That's awesome. And I, I, want, I don't want to lose this opportunity, too. We just had some um, historic announcements from our Supreme Court this, year, this week, and they were devastating for the African-American community. And we have these protection programs and the 8-8 program to where these are programs that are allowing black communities to, to build wealth. And so, Nicholas, can you speak on that? And then, Ted, if, if we have some time, go ahead. Nicholas, pick up. Absolutely. I, I think uh, I want for everybody in the, in the room, under the sound of all of our voices, to understand that elections do have consequences. I want people to also understand that, you know, uh, our minority programs, diversity, equity, and inclusion programs are under attack. And they're under attack in a very sophisticated manner. When we see the Supreme Court ruling that just came down, uh, it, it's very disheartening to see. But these uh, people who are after these programs are finding any potential low-hanging fruit they can. The reality is, is to eliminate diversity, equity, and inclusion programs that are, are, that are targeted uh, of to assist minority communities. It started in education. Right. And so we're saying, oh, you know, it can't be, you know, uh, race can't factor into decisions and things of that nature. But it's going to also now that we have a precedent, it could potentially carry over into programs like the 8A program, like the Hub Zone program that are qualified for minorities where people argue reverse discrimination and things of that nature. So we have to be cautious. We have to be cognizant and we have to insulate. Uh, uh, Ted and the SBA and, 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 and these minority business programs because now there's a new precedent that people could very well argue that set aside contracts which they are sometimes you hear people consider them to be handouts but when they affect communities of color and communities of color benefit from them they're called handouts but when they benefit uh, other communities of non-communities of color they are considered to be subsidies yeah. So pay attention to the language. So we've got to insulate our programs, and we've got to protect these things, Brother Ted. Yeah, I, I think we need to pass the plate after that. Okay. Um, because uh, <laughs> yes. what, what you spoke to, the 8A program is, is under constant attack. When I say attack, I'm talking litigation. Yeah. So the 8A program is being defended in the courts. The 8A program started as a program for people of color. Yeah. Then we included women. That wasn't for y'all, black ladies. 
right? Because you are already included in it. So anytime we have a program that is created for us, by us, it is always under constant attack. So Nicholas was, was correct. Elections have consequences. Number one, I want to keep my job, yeah. right? But yeah. we also want to keep sure that, that we have the, these programs that are intentionally investing in communities of color. Yeah. Man, let me tell you something. I could have had 25 minutes with each individual person on this panel. Please give this panel a round of applause. We only touched the surface of what we wanted to talk about, but we want to thank you, and we want to thank the Louisiana Economic Development Department for hosting and sponsoring this panel. We want to thank each and every one of you for being here and this great audience. Thank you, Essence Festival. We hope that you enjoy. Thank you.